Welcome to the Auto Success Executive Spotlight. I'm your host, Brian Ankney. Today, my guest is Jared Reichard from Reichard Automotive. Welcome, Jared. Oh, thank you so much, Brian, and I appreciate the opportunity to come speak with you. Uh, thank you. Yeah. So, uh, how was the drive up from Columbus today? So, it was uh, rather rather uneventful. Uh, it was only a two-hour uh, drive up here to Akron from Columbus, so uh, easy way up here, two hours of easy driving back, so I appreciate the opportunity. Great. Well, let's, let's get started with just a little bit about you. I'd like to know a little bit about yourself and the career path that led you to where you are today. So I'm going to start off by backing up. I'm actually a third generation automotive dealer. So my grandfather in 1953 uh, purchased Salt Ford in Canal Winchester and he moved his whole family from Erie, Pennsylvania down to Canal Winchester with a hope that one day he can keep this Ford dealership moving. Mm -hmm. uh, fast forward, uh, he did a great job building our company, and then in the early 80s, uh, my father and my Uncle Fred took over the company and uh, with, a game, with a game plan and the goal of becoming the number one Ford dealer in the United States of America. And at, the point, at that time, we had about 30 employees, and we were like number 2,000-something out of 3,000 dealers, <laughs> and it was like the pie-in-the-sky goal, and nobody thought that we can do it, you know? But uh, four years later, my dad, my dad and Fred made that proclamation in 1982 that we're going to be the number one dealer in the next five years. And in 1986, we became the number one Ford dealer in the United States of America. And we kind of we held that from 1986 to 2000. Um, fast forward to today, uh, I'm sitting as third generation and we're a family owned company. We have around 750 employees. We have 11 brands. Uh, very, very fun. And I get to work with my business partner, which is my cousin, Rick Riker, and I get to work with my cousin, Reagan. And it's still a family affair. It's just the third generation. So mm -hmm. um, how I got started in the business was uh, when I was in eighth grade going into my freshman year of high school, I thought I was going to be hanging out by the pool, relaxing. And my dad had other ideas, un <laughs> unfortunately. And I thought it was a little bit of a punishment. But um, I started washing cars and working 40 hours a week. And Looking back, it was one of the greatest things he ever did for me is he gave me an understanding and the respect of the business. That way I can respect what it was when I got older. Uh, so throughout the years, just different jobs every summer going you know, between high school and college. And here I sit, uh, have had a lot of, lot of uh, background, a lot of positions in the company. And it was, a, it was a lot of fun, each one of them. And now in this position, being the president and being the dealer, you, you get a chance to understand what the, your employees are going through and understand what, what that role and uh, involves and it helps you helps you along the way and helps your employees with the understanding. So uh, right now I sit as president. We actually operate on the entrepreneurial operating system, which is a uh, based off a book by Traction of uh, called Traction by Gino Wickman. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's two two roles. Uh, you have the vision visionary and the integrator. My cousin Rick, he is uh, one of the smartest minds in the automotive industry. Uh, and I love working with him, so he is our visionary. And I'm the integrator, so he, he points the ship in the direction. I just make sure there's enough fuel to get where we're going. So uh, that's where I sit in it today, and it's working out well for us. That's, 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 a, that's an interesting way to do it. Yeah. So, so he, 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 he says, hey, we're going to go this way, and, and you make sure you get there. And we have hit every marker to this point of his vision. So kudos to my cousin Rick. He, he sees, you always talk about visionary, seeing around the corner. He's one of those, and we're, we're very lucky to have him. And he happens to be my cousin, and we get along great. And we get to take this dealership and this, this company to another level, I feel, and we get a chance to continue on for the future, hopefully a fourth generation. We'll see. I don't know. <laughs> So right now, dealerships across the country are really experiencing a, a shortage of technicians. I mean, everybody's trying to find them. Everybody's trying to keep them. Everybody's trying to steal them. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> you know, what, what are you doing at, at, with your stores to, to, to address this? Uh, and, and what advice could you offer to other dealers to, uh, you know, fill their service departments? Well, uh, I, I think you're hitting on a topic that comes up more, more often than anything else I hear, which is the, the technicians. And, you know, let's start off with the fact that, you know, these cars are extremely difficult to work on. Mm -hmm. um, being a, Having an opportunity to sit on the board of Columbus State, you know, Boeing 787 flies at 35,000 feet at 600 miles per hour, and I'm basing this all off lines of code, you know, the lines of code that, that you know, power our, our phones, our computers. And that Boeing 787 going 600 miles an hour in the, in the air has about 12 million lines of code. A 2016 F-150 has 150 million lines of code with five computers communicating on three different networks. They're technological marvels. So that's a barrier that we're facing because the technology level in these vehicles that re it requires a tremendous amount of training, a tremendous amount of studying and, and keeping up to date. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. So what we have found and what worked for us greatly was just working with our schools, you know, and, and creating a process and, and being involved with the schools like Columbus State and Hawking College and all the career centers around us. And with building these relationships, we were able to build programs of two. So these programs were, one of them is called the Fast Track Program. It, it gives you an opportunity. The student never has to make that decision. Do I go to college or do I, do I go to good work? That's a tough decision for an 18-year-old. Mm -hmm. So what we decided to do is kind of combine both of them. And they work with us for three days. And then they go to the college two days. And they get the, the great solid foundation for them to become an automotive technician. Uh, what separates us a little bit, too, is we have a, a gentleman that works with us uh, named Brad that is our t director of technician recruiting, development, and retention. All day long is what he concentrates on recruiting and developing and retaining our technicians. And that's a little competitive advantage because we have a proven process. We are, we are firm believers in developing. I mean, let's not keep going down this path, and I think all dealers need to take a look of yeah, you know, let's not fix today's problem. Let's fix the future's problems. Today's problem is you don't have a technician. All right, you can steal one from somebody, but you're not solving the long-term problem. Mm -hmm. And this long-term problem, who's going to end up losing? Well, the consumer's going to lose. Well, why is the consumer going to lose? Well, if we keep stealing them from each other, we keep paying over and over again, you know, we're just going to continually price ourselves out. So we owe it to our communities to make sure that transportation and mobility is affordable. And as these cities keep growing, like Columbus is going to grow by a million people in the next 20 years, we have to make sure mobility is affordable. And it's our obligation to the community. So uh, we, we concentrate heavily on developing from within. We concentrate heavily on making sure that we have great relationships with the uh, community college and, tech, and uh, schools. And then here's a great part about it is, you know, ASC has this great website and this great link. If you're looking for ASC technicians, they have ASC Adopt-A-School. So if you're wondering where to start, every dealer should go to ASC Adopt-A-School and they could start there to figure out, hey, where are the colleges? Where are the schools near me? And I strongly encourage all of us, myself included and dealers across the United States, we have to be involved with these schools because unless we're involved with them, the programs are going to go away and then, then where are we going to train them? So we are, we are heavily involved with the colleges, with the career centers, and we have a proven process for development. Is it, is it perfect? No, I think we're all trying to figure out what's perfect and how many technicians and what's this. But uh, I would have absolutely start with ASC, adopt a school, and get involved with those schools, Brian, because it, sh it taught me so much. Just, just the lines of code and the difficulty of these repairs. And they're only going to get more difficult. Yeah. And these, these colleges and these schools, they need our support of the dealer because they need the training aids to be successful. We're going into the, the most exciting time for automotive, I think, because forever it's always been internal combustion. What kind of piston configuration are you going to use? Now we have hybrid. Now we have fully electric. Now it's getting interesting and we need to make sure we have the training and the know-how to fix these vehicles as they get increasingly more and more difficult. That way mobility stays affordable in these cities and in the United States of America and our communities are able to continue to thrive with affordable transportation. Yeah, you know, I, I was recently visiting a, 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 a college and it, it kind of surprised me that, you know, some of the kids are touching engines, but most of the kids, they're holding, you know, diagnostic devices. Like they're, they're it's, it's like a computer job to fix a car now. <laughs> it is, it is. <laughs> and you, with those computer jobs, being in the shops, what you're seeing is, you know, there's one thing to have it all up here, but, you know, anybody that knows is a technician, they have it up here, but you also have to have it in the hands. And I, I'm going to kind of go back for a second. We, we are strong promoters of the mentor programs with, a call, with, a, with our apprentice technicians. They are always matched up with, a, with an, a mentor technician, and we don't make the cardinal sin, which is uh, getting somebody in the quick lube rack, rack and then leaving them there. You can't leave them there. You have to continually challenge them. So as we challenge them for apprenticeships and then flat rate. So it's a great progression. And yeah, these, these cars nowadays, it's incredible. I mean, just think 150 million lines of code and a 2016 F-150. Yeah, I mean, the sky's the limit for how, more, how much more, more difficult these cars are going to be to, to repair in the future. Yeah. You know that the, the, apprentice, the apprentice program and then also, you know, you had mentioned how, how you have like the three days working with you and two days going to school. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, that's, that's, a lot, that's a lot like interns. I mean, every, every other industry has interns because it's a great way to find talented people and get them to come to work for you. It is. And then they can kind of, they're, they're, they're getting education that's directly towards their craft and through the career, you know. Not saying I never used anything I, I learned in high school or college, but 
If it was focused towards the automotive and focused towards my career, I, I guarantee you I'd pay, pay, I would have paid attention a little bit more in college if I knew it was going to affect my career. Yeah. Let's, let's talk about EVs. Yeah. Um, you know, EVs are coming, and, I mean, they're everywhere. The, the ecosystem of service, you know, the, the way it exists today, I mean, you've got dealers, you have independent repair facilities, you've got quick lubes, you've got tire stores, you've got body shops. It's all kind of separate. Um, how are EVs going to affect that ecosystem, and, and, you know, what are you doing to prepare? So um, there's a lot of layers to this question. Um, the preparation. Um, pre- preparing for EVs is, uh, for the maintenance cycles, I feel as though the, the EVs are going to have a lot, a lot sooner maintenance intervals. Um, just off the electric battery and the torque necessary, you're going to be replacing tires, you're going to be replacing brakes, you're going to be replacing the, kind of the joints and the ball joints and uh, all, the, all the configurables on the vehicle. But it, it goes back to the electric motors create a m- tremendous amount of torque. Uh, side, side note, I had an opportunity to drive a Ford Lightning, and that was one of the funnest cars I've ever driven in my life just because it's so fast. You're not expecting an F-150 to be that fast. And that's a future that we have. So EVs, uh, what do I see? I, I'm going to see a lot more. The, the intervals are going to be a lot shorter. Mm-hmm. And I feel as though with charging, I, I feel it's going to be – 15, 20 years before we're fully involved in, in EVs. We, have, we still have this stage of, we're in internal combustion primarily. We're going to get a stage of primarily just hybrids. And then we're going to go move forward to all electric. But it's exciting times. And how are we preparing? Um, like at our dealership, we're, uh, we have a 67 acre lot and we're going to install, we're going to have our 50th uh, car charger installed by the end of this year. So we're making sure our infrastructure is set up, you know, making sure there's more power coming to our dealership so we can support these chargers. Um, we're changing our mindset when it comes to well, what does a charging station look like? You know, we've already thought of ideas of different ways we can make it engaging for the customer. Is it, is it a diner? Is it a customer lounge? Because when the vehicle is charging, customers, are, customers need somewhere to go. Mm-hmm. You go pump gas, it's five, 10 minutes, you're back on the road. But an EV and charging, it's not going to be the same. So how, what are we going to do to pass the time? So I think we really do need to do a great job of asking consumers what they need and what they're looking for because we get to shape the future with our customers. It's not as though it has to be a certain way. And that's, that's I'll go back to what I said at the beginning. That's why I think it's the most exciting time for, for automotive right now is because there's so many changes and so many variables coming into it. I mean, I mean let's face it, 20 years ago, Tesla, would nobody knew who that was, but that's a big name now. And we are all changing. We're all kind of finding our footprint. But if I, my suggestion to every dealer is just stay up to date. I mean, it's not going to go away. It, it's going to come. It's going to come faster than we all realize uh, when it comes to hybrids and plug-in hybrids and fully electrics. But it's part of our obligation to make sure that that's, we're, we're selling the vehicles that the, the manufacturers are building so we continue this ecosystem moving forward. Now, you already have a restaurant on your campus. Mm-hmm. Are, are, are we going to have Rikert Automotive having a gym and a movie theater and a, maybe an ice skating rink? Or well, like, what, what, what are the ideas you guys are batting around? Well, we actually already have a gym, but that's only for the employees. But, oh. uh, but, <laughs> but it is a good idea. So we're just thinking, you know, just thinking, what is it? Uh, charging stations, workstations, diners, something that's quick, a coffee shop. I mean, these are some ideas that we're just thinking. Nothing's come to fruition, but we want to make sure as we start beta testing and, and start testing the waters on what EV customers truly want because let's face it, we're ICE, ICE internal combustion automotive dealers currently, we're merging to EV dealers. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it could be a slew of different things. Or if these charging chargers are as quick as a gas station pumping gas, then there's really no need for the diner because they're going to be back on the road. But yeah, I, I mean, I think the sky's the limit just depending on what the customers tell us they need and they want. I want, to, I want to come back to people. You know, we, we, we really touched on technicians quite a bit there, but I, let's talk about all, all the people you know, within your business. I mean, people are essential in every department. What, what do you guys do to attract and train and, and retain the talent in the other departments in your dealership? So um, we, uh, we've actually been awarded in Columbus, Ohio, the best places to work for the past I think 10 years. So that, that's always a help oh, wow. to re- recruit. But uh, we have what is called the rules of the road. So these are the five values that we, we ask every, every one of our employees to follow. So we hire, uh, we fire, we promote, and we, uh, we do everything as along the way when it comes to a customer or an employee's life cycle in our business. And what I mean by that is, you know, forever there's always been, you know, who gets the next promotion? 
Well, it's if somebody gets a job, it's like, oh, so-and-so is their favorite. We, we completely in, get rid of all the favoritism. It's a how well you follow the rules of the road and follow our values and how well you do your job. And then also helps them, it helps guide the behaviors that we're looking for. How often do we, do we uh, let somebody go because of something that they're skilled or their skill? It's very rarely. It's usually a behavioral problem, right? Mm -hmm. So we always, we always promote the behaviors that we're looking for. And when you have that clear cut, the guardrails for our employees to know that they have to follow and where we're going, it makes it really, I don't want to say easy, but it makes it, more ap it, makes it a little bit smoother on developing them, smoother on retaining them. And it actually, it's a lot better for recruiting them too because one of the first things we do in an interview is we hand them over and that way the, cus the employee, before they even get the job, they know what they're getting into. Mm -hmm. So uh, one of the great things about the rules of the road is you know, we ask all of our employees carry it around with them. So there's no confusion of what, what we're expecting and what we all should be doing. And we, we highly promote that they leave these behind because this isn't just for internal use. This, we want the world to know what Reichert Automotive is about. What are the values that we follow? What do we believe in? And it, it can't just be our purpose statement for our company is to create lifelong positive relationships. So that's part of this book as well. Our purpose statement, lifelong positive relationships, and it has the values and the behaviors we're looking for too. Well, you know, I mean, in your business, especially being that you're third generation, you probably have multiple lifelong relationships. You know, I mean, there, there's probably five generations of a family that have bought cars from your grandfather, your father, and now are buying them from you, and maybe someday we'll buy them from your children. Uh, it, it has, we are so blessed. With 70 years being in business, we actually have, and you know you're getting old when you have former employees, and when I, was, I hired his grandson to work for us too. So when, not only do we have, have multiple generations of customers, we're, we're having multiple generations of employees too, following along suit with the Riker family. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. <laughs> You know, we have, we have a similar thing to that uh, here at Babcocks. We call it the way we do things around here. But it's, it's the exact same idea. Good. You know, it's, it's a list of things, and, and occasionally they'll, take, they'll add something or, or, or change something to be more, you know, keep it relevant. Yeah. And, uh, but, yeah, it's, it's, we have them hanging up all over the building. All right, so you got, I, I have to read them off. So. Yeah, let's hear them. So rule number one, we're driven. We never sit still. There's always something to do, something to learn, or someone in need. It's our job to stay ahead of the curve, and our passion it keeps us moving forward. Number two is we're trusted. We say what we know. We had say what you mean, but that can get to a slippery slope because we could say what we mean all we want to, but if we really meant what we said sometimes, it's not always the best thing. So say what we know. That's yeah. the transparency. Um, we're trusted. We're sharp. We love to learn. Innovation, all the technology, innovation and marketing are the only two things that make money in a company. Everything else is an expense. We have to stay sharp, stay ahead of the curve. We're welcoming. You ever seen the Chick-fil-A you never know what somebody else is somebody else is going through, and it kind of shows, you know, it goes through. It's a video, it goes through with just all the customers in Chick Fil A, and kind of it's emotional because you never know what somebody's day is like. You never know what they're going through. I don't know what you're going through today. I don't know what to start it off. So we always have to treat each other with respect and be welcoming and smile. And then the final value is we're one team. So one of the great things that me and my cousin Rick do is with our orientation, there's a there's two answers that we never accept. One is, um, that's not my job, which we're one team. We're, we're, you can never accept the answer of that's not my job. If it requires picking up trash or whatever that takes, we're retail. We have to be there for the guests. So we're all one team, when it, whatever, whatever it takes to give the guests the best experience. And the other one is, that's the way we've always done it. That's an answer that we should never give to our employees because there's always a why behind we do something, why we do something. And then if it's the same way we've always done it since 1953, there has to be a better way. So we're always trying to find different ways, different processes, different everything to, to keep moving forward. So the uh, Rules of the Road has been amazing for our company, for our employees enjoy it. They, uh, in their meeting hu uh, morning huddles and meetings, they always go through the values and it kind of it level sets everybody to, all right, we have, the, we have the boundaries. This is what's expected. Let's move forward. Yeah, you know, I, when I... When I sold cars, I actually sold them in Ohio, and it, it, you just reminded me of Saturday morning when you come in and it's there's snow in the cars. Yeah, there's no reason for anybody to not be out there cleaning the cars. You know, like nobody's going to sell them if they're covered in snow. No, I mean, you're all one team at that point. No matter yeah. how deep the snow is or how cold it is, you know you're wearing boots in it and bringing some extra shoes in case. And yeah, I remember those days. It was fun, a little cold, a little, little wet, but it was it was still fun. Yeah, yeah. 
Um, but I'd like to talk to you about customer loyalty a little bit. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I mean, it used to be you drive down the road and every other pickup truck had a picture of a cartoon guy peeing on a Ford <laughs> or peeing on a Chevy, right? <laughs> you don't see those anymore. No. P loyalty has, has kind of, brand loyalty is, is kind of disappearing in the world. What can dealerships do to combat that and create loyalty you know, to the dealership with their customers? So I think the pandemic has, uh, there, there, there's less loyalty than there's ever been. And it's not the customer's fault. I mean, during the pandemic, well, you know, they're, they're on that cycle of needing a new vehicle and it's just whatever was available. I mean, they, were try they weren't only testing out new like nameplates, they were testing out brand new brands. You know, a Toyota customer is driving a Kia, a Ford customer is driving a Hyundai. I mean, everybody's changing the brands. I think it goes back to, you know, our purpose statement of creating life along positive relationships. Mm -hmm. Now, my grandfather always told us that, you know, there's some people not worth doing business with. So we always have to identify those lifelong positive relationships. I guess that is creating that, that loves a Riker Automotive, and we, we owe them the love back. So creating those lifelong positive relationships, whether they've been with us 30 years, 50 years, or 30 days. We have to continually just make them feel at home. And whatever we have now, um, those are our positive relationships. They gave us a chance. and We get, a, get an opportunity to win them over again. So yeah, as much as there's no loyalty right now, it's not the fault of the customer. But what we get an opportunity to do is create loyalty with experience. And that's what's exciting. Well, I mean, you, you do have you do have a car wash, you do have a, a restaurant. It sounds like you're going to have a gym. It sounds like you're going to have an ice skating rink and a soft serve and <laughs> whatever it takes, man. Hey, there's nothing cool about a car. Or I probably shouldn't say it. there's nothing cool about a car dealership, but we get to make it cool now. You know, it's mm -hmm. always been with the charging and with this changing landscape. It's always just been typical new sales, used sales, parts, service, body shop. Yeah. Now we get like. We get restaurants, we get like charging stations, charging diners, charging movie theaters, as you were saying. I mean, yeah. this, this it's endless. So that's what makes it exciting. And we just have to listen to our guests and listen to our consumers. The next five years, we have to listen so much because they're going to tell us. We all have this notion of we understand EV and we really don't. We have to listen to our guests and listen to what they're going through and how do we make it better. Mm -hmm. We always have to find ways to make it better and make them want to keep coming back to us. Well, I want to I want to shift gears a little bit. You you guys recently got into the motorcycle business. Yes. What what inspired you to get you know into the motorcycle business? So, um, growing up, our whole family uh, really avid dirt bike four wheelers, uh, riding riding those all the time. And I actually rode a motorcycle on the road um, right on my 16th birthday. And we always grew up riding with our dads. So we'd always take trips out west and ride and. Uh, my cousin Rick and I have just this huge passion for Harley Davidson motorcycles. Mm -hmm. Our dads have huge passion for Harley Davidson motorcycles. But the really underlying reason is we're, we're a mobility company. You know, we, we're not an automotive dealer. We're not a Harley dealer. We're, we're mobility providers. Whether it's four wheels, two wheels, or 18 wheels, we have to find out what mobility works best for our guests and for, for consumers moving forward. So we just thought of that as it, it was a great addition for mobility to the automotive vehicle mm -hmm. because there's micro mobility. I mean, you go, you go any city, I mean, you're going to see those, the scooters everywhere. I mean, that's mobility by itself. Um, and plus we really, really love the lifestyle brands. Harley Davidson's a lifestyle brand. I mean, there's that passion and that enthusiasm. And once you're there, you get the ether going and you you don't know what to do. And it brings that passion through. That lifestyle brands, we're learning from the lifestyle brands because you look at Jeep, that's a lifestyle brand. Corvette lifestyle brand. Bronco is, gonna, is a lifestyle brand. And that just came out in the past two years, three years. Yeah. So we, are, we feel as though the lifestyle brands is, is going to, that's what people want with the accessorization of vehicles, not the common just plain Jane vehicle. We get the, everybody has a phone with a new phone case and they want to accessorize the phone case. We are so, such in a world of individualism that the lifestyle brands is where you get to express yourself, right? Mm -hmm. So we create that idea of lifestyle brands. How do we roll that kind of into the automotive and how do we flip flop? You know, my cousin Rick said he wants a, in the state of Ohio, he wants every garage to have a, a, a Chevy pickup truck or a Ford pickup truck and a Harley Davidson. And that's, that's where we're at. And we have learned a lot by becoming a Harley Davidson dealer. Um, and they actually have a great brand, Livewire. Livewire is their EV version. And I've had a lot of motorcycles I've ridden. And the Livewire, bar none, is the funnest vehicle, motorcycle I've ever ridden in my life. 
So it just, it's kind of cool. It gives that little little lifestyle brand that we we get a chance to partake with, with our employees. And um, it's been a huge addition. Different business. I mean, most car dealers aren't used to selling merchandise like T-shirts and jackets and bags. So it's, it's exciting because it's new. Yeah. And uh, what prompted us is just our overwhelming passion for the brand of Harley Davidson. What do you ride? I have a, a uh, 2019 Road Glide with a trash turbo on it. Cool. cool. Yeah, it's, it's awesome. Um, it's not a cruiser anymore. It's, it's really fast and it's a lot of fun. So I probably should have rode that up here. You know, when you, you know, when you talk about the lifestyle brand, you know, we, we also have motorcycle and power sports news and like auto success. I can almost promise you that just because somebody drives a Honda Accord uh -huh. doesn't mean they're interested in this interview, <laughs> right? <laughs> but, but the people, but for all the stuff we produce for motorcycle power sports news, the people are so into it. It is it, it, like, they are so, such enthusiasts that everything we create will get like a hundred thousand or 200,000 like views from people that are riders because they, they want to know everything about the business. I mean, people choose to ride. People aren't, people, a, a, an automobile is a commodity. They have to drive a car back and forth to work. They have to drive their kids to school or drive to, to soccer practice. You choose to ride a motorcycle or an or a ATV or a side-by-side. -side. That's the cool thing about it is it's a choice. It's a lifestyle. It, it's not the commonality of what we feel as though in everyday life. Yeah. Well, I, I, I definitely want to shift gears. Uh, this is a big shift. Let's talk about AI. AI is everywhere. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's a part of every conversation. I mean, every newscast, every, I mean, probably half the companies in America right now would have you believe that they are using AI. <laughs> what, are, are, are you afraid of AI? Are you looking forward to AI? How do you see it, you know, you know impacting your business? Um, we've already... Car dealerships already have AI. I mean, we have the automatic responders with, uh, with, with chat, with, with email. So we've already kind of dipped our toes in the world, water of AI. Um, to back up for a second, I got an opportunity to, to learn a little bit about chat GPT. And I, uh, I'm not super well-versed in AI, so I'm just speaking off of what I know. Mm -hmm. But um, AI uh, with chat GPT, one of the questions for the gentleman giving the presentation is, what happens if that gets in the wrong hands? You know, and you can ask it anything. You can ask it how to do a lot of different things. So it's uh, as long as it's used for the right reasons, I think it's going to be extremely beneficial because no longer is it just going to be a quick response to a guest when they reach out to chat. It can become personalized messages. I think AI has the potential to have personalized messages. It could do vehicle ordering, SEO marketing, and up updating content on our blogs or our website. I mean, mm -hmm. the chat GPT can do that. But um I think AI is going to help enhance. Now, is it going to replace? I don't know as far as positions and within a company, but I just feel as though AI is just going to enhance the experience for the guests. And we get an opportunity to use it, and we're going to figure it out together, kind of like figure out EVs together, how we can continually use AI and create that guest experience to another level. Hmm. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's definitely, it's definitely all around us. And, you know, I had, I didn't think about the uh, autoresponders mm -hmm. and some stores are even doing it with the telephone now. It's like service scheduling. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's, it is, it's, I guess there is a lot of it already, already going on. But well, everybody, when you say AI, everybody's mind goes directly to a robot. It's not yeah. necessarily a robot. It's just, you know, little things and trinkets that are in everyday life that we already experience. So it's just going to be enhanced. It's going to be different. And another exciting thing for the automotive industry, how do we, how do we take AI and create that guest experience and, uh, to a next level of, of personalization? Because um, I feel as though the closer we get to the customer, the, closer, the more likely we can create that lifelong positive relationship and we keep moving forward together with them. So I think it can be a great enhancement um, if done the right way and making sure that not used for the wrong reasons. Yep. You know, I had, I had a guest recently that... that had, had a neat way of saying it. And he said, you know, right now you have this, you know, your sales managers spend almost their entire day, you know, touching buttons, finding, you know, the best bank, finding all these things that AI can do like that. And so now instead of the manager being tied to his desk, he can be out there shaking hands. He can meet every single customer. Yeah. You know, I mean, like, you're right. Like, like if you want to create those lifelong relationships, you got to get up, yeah. go shake hands. Got to go shake hands. And the great thing is the AI is, you know, how many emails, like you're saying, I mean, it creates a template for you. It's instead of you taking 15 minutes on the email, or you only take three minutes on the email. How beneficial is that for a sales manager or a salesman or a service advisor to, to cut, you know, if they have 15, 20 guests to get back to that day, 
if they cut their time by 10 minutes on each one of them, think of how much more free time they can create and experience for the guests in front of them. So yeah. that's, that's the wonderful thing about, I think AI is going to shift towards. Cool. Well, I, I got one last question for you. It's not really an easy one. <laughs> I mean, we, we've talked about, you know, washing cars right after eighth grade, all the way up through today, you know, getting some Harley dealerships and everything in between. What's next for Jared? Um, uh, I don't like to think of it as what's next for Rikert Automotive because we have a wonderful leadership team and we all have our goal. We have a common goal and it's a certain dollar amount we want to get to revenue. Um, what's next? Um, we, I, I didn't get a chance to mention, we, we, are, we are big into fleet commercial. Um, we have a 113,000 square foot facility in Groveport, Ohio which has uh, 55,000 square feet of just nothing but service. So the fleet commercial, the business to business, and why it excites me is the business to business, and kind of like our mindset is, we get to support the businesses that support the community with fleet commercial. And we happen to be pretty good at it. So that's kind of our niche, and we want to continually grow that as Columbus keeps growing. That way we can support those, brand, those companies, you know, like the HVAC company, the elect electrical company, the lawn company, whatever it might be. Mm -hmm. But if we have this growth that's going to happen in Columbus, we have to support those businesses. That way they can support the community. So we want to continually grow our fleet and commercial. Um, what's next on the horizon? We want to continually add brands and not add experience because the lifelong positive relationship, just because we have 11 brands doesn't mean that's what the 11 brands that the only 11 brands people want to buy. So mm -hmm. I think there's going to be more brands for us in our future, hopefully. And as we continue down this path, um, just continually fine tune, growing our fleet and commercial, growing our retail, growing our, our culture. Our culture is something special, and I'm, I'm so happy we have the best employees in the world. And I always tell everybody, it's not because Jared Reichert is a cool guy, that's why we have a great, great culture. It's everything else. I have nothing to do with it. It's all the employees create that culture. Mm -hmm. So our, we are in a position now because you know, culture eats strategy for breakfast. We could have the greatest strategy and the greatest idea of where we're going, but unless we have that culture to support our growth and our vision, then we're not gonna get there. So we have this amazing culture, we have the most amazing employees, and what I see for the future is more brands and, you know, just different ways to do business. I, I'm, I'm very excited and continue on working with the schools and, and developing technicians and continue growing the business together and nationwide. I truly believe that our obligation to the community is to provide those services for the guests. So I just want to do it on a bigger scale and maybe not always Columbus, maybe some other cities in the future, but if not, mm -hmm. not a big deal. I love Columbus, Ohio. Yeah. Well, and you're a Bengals fan, so you're, yes, you're, I you're, am. you're, close, you're close to the jungle. <laughs> for my 40th birthday, so my mom was a lifelong Bengals fan. For my 40th birthday, um, I, I took my, my dad and my cousins and my brother, and we all went out to the, to the Bengals Super Bowl game. I mean, they lost, but what a great experience. Oh, yeah. I mean, I only witnessed like 30 years of not-so-great experiences with the Bengals, and like when I turned 40 to go see them in the Super Bowl was the most amazing thing. Well, you know, this, this year you have NADA and then the AIM Expo and yeah. then the Super Bowl all in Las Vegas. So when the Bengals are there, mm -hmm. you can just stay an extra day. That's what I was thinking. I already, I already <laughs> talked to everybody. I, that's, that's the thing we're going to do. And yeah. you got to come out, too, because oh, I yeah. know you're a Bengals fan, too. Yeah. We gotta, if they're in the Super Bowl, we got to go out and see them. Yeah, yeah, you got it. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, thank you for coming, Jared. Is there anything you like, you'd like to share with the audience before we go? Uh, there's nothing in particular. Uh, I, I do want to say, if you get an opportunity, go to ASC Adopt a School. Um, let, let's make sure that we're developing technicians for, for across the United States of America. you got to start with the school. So I, I ask all the dealers and everybody, look at ASC Adopt a School, and let, let's get in these schools and provide them the training aids they need so we, so we can support the communities that we live in because the technology keeps getting higher and higher unless we have the training aids and support and, tra and, uh, and schooling for these students, for technicians. Uh, it's going to be a long battle or a big hill to climb. So get out there, get involved with the schools, let's provide them the training aids, and let's create a great experience for our guests as we move into the, the ICE, hybrid, and, and EV era. Great. Thank awesome. you for coming. Hey, thank you very much, Brian. I really appreciate it. And thank you for taking the time to join us for this Auto Success Executive Spotlight. I'm your host, Brian Ankney. Today, our guest has been Jared Reichard from Reichard Automotive. We hope to see you again soon. This episode is Over the Curb and Burning Gas.